begin reading in verse 1. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so that as, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Your Heavenly Father, we thank you for the songs that have been sung and the fellowship we've enjoyed together. Thank you for the Word of God, most of all that we have just read. I'm asking, sweet Holy Spirit of God, that you make the truth real to our hearts. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Spirit. And allow me to preach and teach the Word of God with truth without heresy. And as your Word goes forth, that it would land on fertile ground and produce fruit in the heart and life the one that speaks and those that listen. Praying, dear God, tonight, if somebody's lost, they'd get saved, for a saint of God to get encouraged to serve you, and dear Lord, that Christ would be high and lifted up. We commit the service unto you and ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. In Romans chapter 1 and in verse 20, the last two words that we read, I want to utilize this evening for this a brief lesson message without excuse Romans chapter 1 verse 20 the last two words of that verse are without excuse and I want to uh, preach on that tonight without excuse a man is without excuse pertaining to God in getting saved he's without excuse in living for God he is without excuse in the matters of the judgment of God, there will be no excuse to hide behind on judgment day. Man from the beginning and in the garden has been used to making up excuses and giving excuses. You see that with Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam said it was because of a woman that she gave me. And the woman said it's because the snake beguiled her. But man is without excuse. There'll be no excuse in the day of judgment. On the view of God himself, the Bible gives us uh, three points of view that's particular uh, today 
and uh, Psalm 14, 1 is where there is the, the view of the atheist. In Psalm 14 and in 1, the Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. This would be the viewpoint of the atheist. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I believe from Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2, from the mouth, lips of Pharaoh, you can see another uh, view on God. It would be called agnostic. And uh, it's in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, when Moses is speaking to Pharaoh, the Bible says in Exodus 5, 2, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. The agnostic point of view on God is that uh, if there is a God, I don't know him. And uh, I won't obey somebody that I don't know. So if there is, I... Maybe there is, maybe there's not, but I don't know him and I will not obey him. That is an agnostic point of view. And then there is the believer's point of view, or at least it should be the believer's point of view, stated by the Apostle Paul, the same author of the book of Romans, wrote Philippians. And in Philippians, in chapter 3, he makes a statement. That ought to be the believer's statement in Philippians chapter 3 and in verse 10. Where the Bible says, that Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. That is the believer's point of view. That... In the believer's point of view, like Paul, Paul knew God from a religious standpoint as a, a young adult. He had grown up in religion and he had gained a high scholarly, intellectual, educational point of view of God under the Pharisees and scribes. He had learned that. He had an intellectual viewpoint of God. But then Paul learned about God through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And uh, he was never the same anymore. And so he got saved on the road to Damascus. And it was a point in time when he went from being religious and a persecutor to having a relationship with Christ and being a preacher. Paul then desired to know Christ on a deeper level. And it's regarding the power of God that raised up Jesus from the dead. And the gospel message is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And Paul knew that Jesus was raised from the dead. He met him on the road to Damascus. And he said, I, I want to know Christ on that level. The, the power that raised up Christ from the dead. I, I want to know God at that level. I want to be able to live for God through the power of the resurrection of Christ. I want to be able to die daily through the power of the resurrection that raised up the Lord Jesus. I want to be able to handle suffering and persecution through the power that raised up Jesus from the dead, being conformable to his death. And he did that. And then because of that, he wanted everyone else to know about God personally as well. And part of that is contained here in the book of Romans. And he is the author of the book of Romans through the Holy Spirit of God. And he tells us that uh, you can know God. And he makes his way through verse 20 and says that we're going to be without excuse in our relationship with God and our growth for God and our knowledge of God and that the judgment seed of God of Christ will be without excuse. He wanted people to know that. I want you to notice this evening on this thought of without excuse, the revelation of God. In our text this evening of Romans chapter 1, the Bible says that God has revealed himself. And in verses 19 and 20, the Bible says 
because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him, God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God has revealed himself, and he tells us this because God has made himself known unto us. In holding our spot there, I'll take you to Psalm 19 in correlation with that portion of scripture that God has made himself known to us. And Psalm 19 allows us to understand what he's talking about. In Psalm 19, in uh, verses 1 through 6, God has made himself known to you and I, we could say, because of the sky creation. It declares the glory of God. In Psalm 19, verse 1, the Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. He's talking about the rising and setting of the sun. He's talking about the sun, the moon, the stars. He's talking about as you and I look up in the day, we see the sun. As we look in the night, we see the moon, we see the galaxy, we see the stars, it's the very handiwork, the creation of God, and there is no part of the planet, no matter what language that they speak, where that line has not gone forth. And so they, anybody, whatever race, creed, or color, can look up and understand that because there was a creation, there had to be a creator. And so he has revealed himself through creation. And Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says the same thing, that by him all things were made, he holds all things together. Now, I'm saying that this evening, that uh, the Apostle Paul tells us, and the Word of God tells us, that God has manifest himself to us, and he's done it as we even look up at the sky at creation. And then not only that, still in Psalm chapter 19, the revelation of God has been through uh, the visible as we look up at the sky, we look at creation, and we see everything that God has made, but also it's through the scriptures. In Psalm 19 and continuing on in verse 7, the Bible says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening his, the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, uh, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, or by the word of God, or the judgments of God, or the statutes of God, all of that is speaking about the same thing, the word of God, Moreover, by them, the Bible, is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. There is a warning from the Word of God, and then when an individual submits to the Word of God, then there is a reward for the individual that submits to the Word of God. And so the revelation of God is not only through the sky and creation, but through the scriptures and revelation. I'm talking about the Word of God, I'm talking about the Bible, and I'm talking about the King James Bible. It's inspired, it's preserved, it's settled in heaven, it's perfect, it is without error, it's tried, it's tested, it's been proven, and it stood the test of time under Satan's attack. The Word of God. And then not only the revelation of God in the sky and in the scriptures, but in the saint himself. In Psalm chapter 19 and verse 12, the Bible says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. How would you know that you had error? How would you know that you had fault? 
How would you know that you're breaking the law? How would you know that you're exceeding the speed limit? Because there has to be a law that's posted. And so there has to be a commandment that is given. The basics is the Ten Commandments. And then the rest follows. And it's because as the law entered in, I realized that I have broken God's laws. How do I know it? It's through the Word of God. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Watch this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, of my strength and my Redeemer. This is speaking about the saint of God. Now you notice this back in our text, the revelation of God. And we're in Romans chapter 1. He says it's been that God has been revealed to you, manifest himself to you in verses 19 and 20. And then uh, I said it's through creation and revelation and then the, the saint of God. In verse 16 of this portion of scripture, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's the power of God, the salvation of God that is demonstrated in the changed life of a child of God. When a saint of God submits to the word of God and allows his salvation to work out of him, then individuals that knew you maybe before that you got saved and then know you after that you got saved cannot deny that there's been some change in your life by the grace of God. In fact, uh, Paul, by his own words in 1 Timothy 1.13, I'm holding my spot in Romans. In 1 Timothy 1.13, the Bible says that he says before that he was a blasphemer. In 1 Timothy 1.13, the Bible says of himself, who was before a blasphemer. A blasphemer is taking the name of Jesus in vain. It is taking the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in vain. It's blasphemy against God. The Bible says who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor. He persecuted the church of the living God and injurious. He caused harm to Christians. This was before that he got saved. Before that you got saved, maybe uh, you didn't care too much about the name of Jesus. Maybe before that you got saved, you were invited to church and it, it didn't mean too much to you because it was about Jesus or about uh, Christian folk or about the Bible or about God. And so he had a form of religion, but he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a blasphemer. On the road to Damascus, when he met Jesus, the Lord Jesus showed up and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And his response was, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And what Paul was doing was persecuting the church. And when he persecuted the church, he was, as likewise, he was persecuting Jesus. And so he was a persecutor. He was injurious. In fact, he caused harm to Christians. He said, but I obtained mercy because I did it in, ignorantly in unbelief. He did not believe on the name of the Lord Jesus. He did not uh, believe in the New Testament. He, he did not believe in Christianity. And so he did it ignorantly in unbelief. There was a change that took place in his life. Verse 14 says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundantly with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Grace. He's the grace preacher. It's the age of grace. By the grace of God that he got saved. It's by the grace of God that you got saved if you're saved. And he says, all because of grace. When, when God could have killed him in his tracks, instead God saved him. Turned him into a preacher on the road to Damascus. And he said he couldn't get over that grace. There was a change that took place in his life. And so because of that, verse 15 says... This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 
He owned it personally. He said that he was a sinner above sinners because he persecuted the church of the living God. And he recognized that and he knew that in his old self. And he said, Jesus showed up to save me. And he owned it. Lord Jesus came into the world to save you. You look at your life before the Lord Jesus Christ. You look at your life after the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what would make you to come to a church on a, on a Wednesday evening and, and sit and open up the Word of God and study the Word of God and have a desire for the Word of God? Because now uh, you love Jesus. Because now you want to know Jesus. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. In verse 16, the Bible says, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Long suffering. Long suffering with a religious individual. Long suffering with an atheist. Long suffering with an agnostic. Long suffering with you. If you're not saved, God is long suffering. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loves you and Jesus died for you. Talking about the saint of God. He said that he was chief of sinners. And when you see somebody get saved and get changed, it is a revelation of God in their life. It would behoove you and I to be engaged in telling others about Jesus. In our text in Romans in chapter 1, it, it's not only that uh, God uh, revealed Himself, and He reveals Himself as you look up and as you look in and as you look around and you see uh, people's lives changed. There is not only this revelation of God, but there's the declaration of God. In Romans chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he says, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. The declaration of God, Jesus Christ is declared to be the Son of God. And Jesus Christ should be declared as the Son of God. He is God the Son and He is the Son of God. There is proof of that because God raised Him from the dead. And uh, this apostleship is a sent one. There's no living apostles now. They had to have seen the risen Savior. But by the eye of faith... And, and owning it as being one that is sent, he says, obedience to the faith among all nations. That is the declaration of God. Uh, notice this in Jeremiah in chapter 14. In Jeremiah chapter 14, there is a portion of scripture that is uh, Jeremiah wanting God to be known in the land. In Jeremiah chapter 14, the Bible says in verse 7, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. This is Jeremiah testifying of the sins of his nation. And it would be like today you and I testifying of the sins of ourselves and of our nation. Verse 8, O the hope of Israel, O the hope of America, the Savior thereof in time of trouble, why shouldest thou be as a stranger in the land, and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for a night? Why shouldest thou be as a man astonished, as a mighty man that cannot save? Yet thou, O Lord, art in the midst of us, and we are called by thy name. Leave us not. Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wonder. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Jeremiah is saying, God, don't be a stranger in the land. 
You're the Savior of Israel. We, we would say you're the Savior of America. It, it seems like God is being a stranger in the land because the children of God are shrinking back from telling people about God and standing up for God and standing up for good. And that God is a stranger and He would say, they're wandering from me. They're wandering far from me and they're, they're uh, loving their sin instead of the Savior. The declaration of God, Jesus, the Son of God, making God known in the land. Likewise, you notice this in Judges and in chapter 2. Joshua judges and in chapter 2. In a time of great apostasy within the nation, early in Judges chapter 2 and in verse 10, the Bible says, And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, all that generation. I think of all the generation of fundamentalists. A fundamentalist believes the Bible. A fundamentalist does not correct the Bible. A fundamentalist believes the Bible. A fundamentalist believes the, the basic tenets of the Word of God. They, they reject new things. That is a fundamentalist of the faith. Does it take a new message? Does it take a new means? Does it take uh, new music? It's fundamental. And the fundamentalists are going by the wayside. And also all that fundamental generation, all that generation were gathered under their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And because of that, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Balaam is the multiplicity of false gods that appeal to the flesh. It is immorality. It is as the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. It is of the sacrifice of, of babies. It's all of the demonic type of servitude that's apart from God. And they, forsook, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, the gods of the people that were around about them, and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. You see, the declaration of God is up to you and I so that we would be making the next generation to know about God. It's up to God's children. It's up to His Christians to do due diligence, to get the knowledge of God to their own children, to the next generation. It is the fulfillment of Acts 1-8, which ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. It's to our town, it's to our people, it's to our country, it's to our state, it's to the nation, it's to the foreign mission field that we would be involved in that. The Bible says, how will they hear? In Romans 10, 14, there is a call for next generation preachers to step up. In Romans 10, 14, the Bible says, How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. This is the declaration of God. How is it done? It's by uh, answering the call. What's the call, preacher? It's from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Ezekiel 33, 7, the Bible says, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. 
Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. What is that in today's economy? That you'll take the word of God and you'll invest in the word of God and then yet you would declare the word of God to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation wherever that you go. It's the declaration of the, the word of God. In Romans and in chapter 1, there's the promise not only of the declaration of God, there's the promise of salvation from God. There is a promise of salvation from God. God has revealed Himself. There is the declaring of what uh, God has showed to you and I. And then there's a promise in verse 16 of the salvation of God. Verse 16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now notice it. To everyone that believeth. To everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. To everyone that believeth. All you have to do is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Anyone, Romans 10, 13, can be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone can be saved. Anywhere, in private or in public, you, you could be hanging on a cross with just the thread of life left. So much as saying, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And he promised today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You could be laying on a hospital bed, knocking on death's door with enough mental cognizance to accept Christ as Savior. You could be in the prison door springing in with a light and saying, What must I do to be saved? And hear the words resonate. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You could be down by the river praying but still unsaved and have the Lord open up Lydia's heart and attend to the words that Paul spoke Anywhere. Anywhere. Anytime. Day or night. Day or night. Until it's too late. Genesis 6-3 tells when it's too late. When is it too late, preacher? I don't know when it's too late. God knows. He said, because my spirit shall not always strive with man. Salvation of God is to everyone who believeth. The Holy Spirit of God impresses upon your heart. You need to get saved. You need to do it today. Here's last. This is out of Romans chapter 1. There's the revelation of God and He's revealed Himself. There's the declaration of God that you and I need to be involved with. There's the salvation of God to everyone who believeth. They'll simply believe. And then last, there's the adjudication of God. It means judgment. It's righteous judgment. In verse 18, the Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He's the light that lighteth every man. John chapter 1. And whenever somebody here in America or over in Russia or over in China or Australia or the furthest parts looks up, then the light that is within them signifies there had to be a creator. 
And if you will respond to the light that God has given, He'll get you more light. The adjudication is judgment. The wrath of God is revealed and man is without excuse. Guilty as charged for breaking God's law. Angels who fell and left their first estate. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 6, 3, that saints are going to judge angels. Sinners who rejected Christ and wouldn't get saved. I don't know this. Some people are dogmatic about it. I don't know. But the Bible does say that in the last book of the Bible that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You would wonder why there's tears in heaven. And some would say that uh, loved ones would uh, see the, the people cast into the lake of fire. Some would go as far to say that almost as sitting as, as a jury as is modeled in our court system today. A jury of peers. God is righteous and we are unrighteous. And standing before a righteous God the Bible speaks about that their works will be indicated. If the works were indicated and you were standing before God this evening and you look at the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you've looked on a woman to commit a lust in your heart, you've committed adultery already. already. If you've hated your brother, you've committed murder. If you've coveted, you have stolen. If you stood before God based on one of those, would you be guilty or innocent? If you stood before God and you had broken one of those, and it was determined you were guilty, and there was a jury of peers and they were determined guilt, guilty, guilty. Well, what's, the, what's the sentence? The lake of fire. You and I as a child of God, the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. When you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't stand at the great white throne judgment. You'll be standing at the bema seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. And he'll say, give your Bible, give your church, give your pastor, give your teachers, Give you opportunity. Supplied you with everything. The goodness of God gave you air conditioning. Goodness of God gave you health for a job. The goodness of God met your needs. What did you do for Jesus? So we will be guilty as well. Won't, you won't lose your salvation. But there is a whole lot of us that are going to be ashamed when Jesus comes back of what all He's done for us and how little we've done for Him. Without excuse, it pertains to the person that's lost. If you're lost, you've broken God's law, you need to get saved. Saved individual, praise God for that. You've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Blood of Jesus Christ. Christ cleanses you from all sin. No condemnation in Christ Jesus. But what have you done for him since you've been saved? 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the Word of God. Thank you, dear Lord, for salvation in Christ alone, that you not only save us, you keep us saved. And then, dear Lord, you allow us to serve you. We thank you for that. Help us, dear God, to be about the Father's business. Help us to be declaring the Word of God to others so that they can at least hear and make a conscious choice to receive or to reject. Forgive us of our sins. Help us, dear God, to be more obedient to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.